Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to this event with Russ Paldrack, discussing his new book, Hard to Break, Why Our Brains Make Habits Stick, in conversation with Liz Phelps. This evening's lecture is a part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now far beyond that. We have an amazing array of science book talks coming up. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll be hosting Carlo Rovelli for his latest book, Helgoland, Making Sense of the Quantum Revolution. And Wednesday, we will host Jordan Ellenberg for his new book, Shape, The Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and Everything Else. To learn more about the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com slash science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. We also have a YouTube page where you can view previous talks that you might have missed, and I'm going to post links in the Zoom chat in just a few minutes. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question, and we're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. I'd also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage during these very strange virtual times. Your support makes this series possible, and it does ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, for indie book selling, and especially for science. And finally, as you've likely experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am honored to introduce tonight's speakers. Neuroscientist Russ Paldrack is the Albert Ray Lang Professor in the Department of Psychology at Stanford University and the director of the Stanford Center for Reproducible Neuroscience. Through his research, Dr. Paldrack uses neuroimaging to understand the brain systems underlying decision-making and executive function. He's also the author of the 2018 book, The New Mind Readers, What Neuroimaging Can and Cannot Reveal About Our Thoughts. Joining him in conversation tonight is fellow neuroscientist Liz Phelps, the Pershing Square Professor of Human Neuroscience in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. Her award-winning research lies at the intersection of memory, learning, emotion, and decision-making. Tonight, they will be discussing Dr. Paul Drack's latest book, Hard to Break, hailed as authoritative, brilliant, and entertaining. The book not only details the habits of individuals, but also discusses the massive societal habit changes that'll be needed to address the biggest challenges of our time. Author and psychologist Angela Duckworth praises the book writing, Russ Paldrack is the rare scientist who can push the frontier of knowledge forward and also reach back, offer his hand and help the rest of us catch up. We're so pleased to host them for this event tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Phelps and Dr. Paldrack, the digital podium is yours. Thank you so much. So it's, um, it's an honor to be here and to host this discussion with my longtime colleague, Russ Poldrack. Um, I'm just gonna give, go through a series of questions uh, for Russ and hear a little bit about what he has to say and then happy to take your questions at the end. So to start, my first question for you, Russ. So I've known Russ, I should say, since he was a wee grad student. Um, and that's, that's you know, a little more than 20 years. I'm not gonna say exactly how long because it'll embarrass us both. But, um, but at that time, even as a grad student, Russ was doing some of the very first studies looking at the, relation, the, the, the representation of habits and habit learning in the human brain. So Russ has been doing this his entire career. He is one of the world's experts uh, or the world expert on this topic in terms of human brain. And so the first question I have for you, Russ, is why did you write this book now? What, what, what motivated you to finally do this book that really has encapsulate what you've been doing your entire career? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. It's fun to, to have a discussion about this with you. Um, it, it's an interesting question. You know, um, it took me a long time to decide that I could write a book at all. And um, the, the first book that I wrote, The New Mind Readers, you know, was I wrote because I felt like I had a story to tell um, and that I was the right person to tell it. And I kind of felt the same way about this. You know, it's like this is a 
a set of questions that I've been thinking about for a long time. And there's been, you know, I think the work that we did and that others have done, you know, over the last couple of decades have made a lot of progress. And then there's particularly been a lot of progress in the last few years coming out of uh, some of the new techniques that people have been developing in neuroscience. And, um, and it seemed like the right time to write this book. You know, there's, there's lots of books out about habits, right? And, and there's, there's lots of really good books, but none of them had really sort of um, gone into the depth about the neuroscience of habits that I thought was really necessary for someone to really understand where they come from. So, so who is this book for? Like when you were writing the book, who, who in your mind was the, the reader of the book? Um, it's really for somebody who, you know, is, is not an expert in neuroscience, but knows, you know, knows a little bit and is really interested in sort of, you know, learning a lot more about how these things works and isn't afraid of, you know, some sort of sophisticated uh, science writing. You know, it, it definitely, you know, I definitely try to keep it as, you know, sort of accessible as possible to people without deep expertise in neuroscience, but, but I don't shy away from, you know, going into a little bit of detail when I think it's really necessary to understand how these things work. Yeah, so, you know, as a neuroscientist, when I was reading the book, you know, even if I wasn't interested in habits, I would want to read it because you do such a good job at explaining some of these new complicated techniques that are coming up, and particularly in the animal work. Um, and so it's, it's a student, it's a book I want my students to read, you know, partially because it's great. It's a great book about the, the neuroscience of habits, but partially because you also really do a good job at explaining the neuroscience in a way that I think a non-expert would understand, um, which doesn't surprise me given your history in, uh, as in, in studying brain imaging and the human brain. Okay, so I want to now start with the basics. Could you say, could you define what is a habit and what isn't a habit? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of like, a, there's, there's a few ways to define them, right? You know, uh, sort of intuitively, think, we think of habits as sort of, you know, routines or things that we sort of do automatically. Like, you know, William James talked about habits in, you know, when he wrote about them in the 1800s about like, you know, all the sort of the routines that we automate so we don't have to think about them because otherwise we would be spending every moment thinking about like, you know, do, when I get up in the morning, having to think about now I have to press the button to turn on the coffee machine, which way do I move the lever on the espresso machine, you know, all those types of things that, that sort of remain the same in the world um, in general. And so, you know, there's no need for us to sort of, you know, continue to think about them each time. So, so that's one way to think about habits is sort of like the routines that we automate because, um, because we don't need to think about them because the world is remaining the same, right? And there's, it's important to keep in mind, right, that there's one, there's one set of things that don't change in the world. Like think about driving, right? The way that the pedals work in your car generally don't change, but like the place you park in the parking garage every day, if you, assuming you don't have your own parking spot, that changes from day to day, right? And one of the things, you know, you and I both worked a long time ago on these questions about, you know, the different memory systems in the brain. And one of the important things we've learned is that the brain systems for habits are distinct from the brain systems that allow us to actually, you know, kind of consciously remember the events that happened, right? And we, and that's sort of intuitive, right? We often, because we often have these slips where like, we can't remember if we locked the door or not, right? Because locking the door becomes a habit and we just no longer even generate a memory for it. Um, so that's, that's one way to think about habits. Another way is that, that scientists focus more on has to do with, um, sort of how they're generated and why or why they uh, why they sort of hang around um so think about like why do we do things in general when the first time we do think we do something we do it because we have a goal in mind right we like i go to the refrigerator because i want because i'm thirsty and i want something to drink um we call that a goal directed behavior but over time if if something gets done over and over again um, it can start to basically take on a life of its own, such that even if the goal isn't important anymore, um, the, the, the organism, that being me or a rat or whoever else is being studied, um, will still do the thing. Um, so that it becomes basically the goal doesn't matter anymore. And that, that's important for like why habits continue to hang around, right? Because when the goal doesn't matter anymore, even if the, the reward goes away, you keep doing the thing anyway. And what isn't a habit? What isn't a habit? Well, we think goal-directed behaviors in general, like things that we do in order to explicitly achieve a goal, 
we think of generally are not habits. Yeah. Um, and that's at least for scientists, that's the big distinction that we make. Um, now, you know, there's there's debates about, you know, exactly where to draw that line. But that's kind of the, the big difference is like when I when I do something with intention, with conscious intention towards a goal, that's what we think of as not being a habit. So every day our actions are some combination of the two. Exactly. So so you talk a lot about dopamine. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give you like an opportunity to sort of talk a little bit about why dopamine is so important for habits. Right. And then I'll ask you a few more questions about that. Do, do, uh, Von Bell called dopamine the Kim Kardashian of neurotransmitters. <laughs> um, yeah. So why is dopamine so important for habits? So, you know, dopamine, everybody thinks of dopamine as having something to do with like pleasure or, you know, reward. And it, it certainly is related, but you know, what we've learned about dopamine, well, dopamine is incredibly complex, right? There's, you know, many different types of dopamine receptors in the brain, and it does different things in different parts of the brain. But with respect to habits, the really important um, aspect of dopamine is that, um, so when we, when we receive a reward, or when we encounter some thing in the world that tells us we're going to get a reward, that causes the release of dopamine. And um, there's, when we're going out you know, through the world, kind of choosing what to do, one of the important ways that that happens is in you know, the connections from our cerebral cortex down into our basal ganglia, um, end up sort of competing with one another. Like, you know, I, let's say I want to, I, I come to a fork in the road, I have to decide, to, do I go left or right? There's going to be one subset of neurons saying, go left. There's going to be another subset saying, go right. One of them is going to win. And let's say that, you know, I then like, you know, end up in a really great place at the end of the road. Um, that's going to, um, you know, cause some dopamine to be released. And one of the things that we know that dopamine does in the basal ganglia is when neurons are firing together at the same time and there's dopamine, it causes those connections to get stronger. And so that, what that means is next time those, because the neurons with the stronger connections have a, a greater likelihood of winning that competition. And so you're more, you're going to be more likely to do the thing. This is sort of an explanation for this, you know, there's this thing in psychologists called the law of effect, which is like, you know, one of the most obvious laws ever. It's like, if you, if you do something and it gives you good stuff, you're going to do it more often. If you do stuff, something and it gives you bad stuff, you're going to do it less often, right? This, the, that action of dopamine provides an explanation for that thing that we've known forever about human behavior. So, okay. But, you know, you say it's not all about pleasure, right? So, so what do people get wrong about dopamine? Yeah. So, um, so it, it's reasonable why people would think it's about pleasure because um, you often the situations when dopamine is being released are situations that are related to things that people find pleasurable. But the distinction that one that's really important to make is between, and this comes from, this was really kind of developed by Kent Barrage, a neuroscientist in Michigan, um, who, distinct, who came up with this distinction between what he called liking and wanting, right? And often those things move together, but it turns out that in the brain, chemically, they, they don't, right? And so you can see that if you go in and sort of manipulate dopamine and see what happens, you know? And so it turns out that if you like, let's take a rat and you, you give it a drug that kind of, you know, depresses its dopamine function. Um, it turns out that the rat doesn't actually, from what we can tell, lose its ability to experience pleasure. And we can tell that by like, you know, they do research where they video the face of the faces of rats and like see whether they, whether they show these sort of like, you know, outward signs of pleasure. That's, um, like, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. Like, you know, like licking their, licking their fingers and all these kind of things. Um, and it turns out that, you know, rats whose dopamine system has been depressed don't show any, they basically still show all the outward signs of pleasure. What they don't do is actually like go work to get food. So you can, if you make it at all difficult for them to, to like, you know, go get something they like, they'll just sort of, they won't do it. So they kind of become little, you know, couch potato rats. Um, and so, so this has led to this idea that, you know, dopamine is really important, not so much for the, the pleasurable aspects of reward, but sort of the the wanting, what we call the incentive aspects of reward, 
Um, and it, it, you know, it sort of fits with this idea that, you know, we know from, from lots of, you know, people talking about addiction, right? That at some point addiction, you know, we know dopamine plays a central role in addiction. Um, and, you know, when somebody becomes addicted, it's not as if they're continuing to take the drug to continue to get pleasure, right? What they're usually doing is continue to continue to take the drug just to get back to where they started. Um, and, uh, and part of that is driven by this, you know, this sort of, um, the, the strong craving and incentive that one's the, the kind of wanting that you get from the changes in the dopamine system that happen in addiction. So about addiction. So is it is addiction just a habit? Is there more to it than that? How do we think about that? Um, yeah, there, it, this is a controversial topic right now, because, you know, many people think of addiction as being about habits. But if you look at, you know, what look at how, you know, what, what happens in addiction, you know, we don't usually think of habits as being really kind of like flexible sorts of behaviors. We think of habits as being like, you know, the thing that we automatically do in a situation. But if you look at the way that, you know, that people who are addicted to drugs go about trying to obtain drugs, they're really creative and sort of flexible behaviors um, that don't look like habits. And so one idea that's developed um, that's you know sort of related to, to ideas that have come from uh, Fiery Cushman, who's at Harvard, um, and Lee Hogarth in England have developed this idea that um, that it might be that the what becomes habitual is just the the goal. This the the goal of getting drugs becomes the habit, and um, the 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 actual taking of the drug drug isn't really a habit. It's the the kind of the getting of the the, the wanting of the drug becomes the habit. Complicated. So, so okay. Why are habits? So, you use the word sticky a lot yeah. in your book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why are habits sticky, and what do you mean by sticky? What I mean by sticky is is largely that they they they're really hard to get rid of. Like you know, they don't go away on their own, and even when you try to change them, uh, it's very challenging, and they tend to come back. Um, and so, why? I mean, there's there's various ways to answer that question, right? You know. Um, I think evolutionarily, why we have habits that are sticky is that you know we we generally lived in during evolution we lived in um, environments that you know that didn't change anywhere near as fast as our world changes now, right? Um, and so it made sense for our brain to basically learn how to do things and then just kind of hold on to that, right? Um, and so that strategy turns out to to work until it doesn't. And when it doesn't is when the world changes or when, you know, things go from being, uh, you know, adaptive to, to non-adaptive. And in particularly in the context of, you know, the kinds of rewards that we experience in the world today um, and the kind of, you know, incentives that we experience like like drugs, like, you know, ultra processed, hyper palatable foods, like digital devices that provide us lots of, you know, novel social information, all these things that we think probably drive, you know, increased dopamine release. Um, they make it particularly hard, they make it particularly easy to develop habits, and then those things can be particularly hard to change. Um, you know, so some of the ways in which some of the things that happen in habits that I think are particularly important for the stickiness. Um, one is just the degree to which habits become mindless, right? That you don't, you, you're completely unaware that you're engaged in a habit. And when you're unaware of something, it's very hard to stop yourself from doing it, right? Um, and, and getting insight into, you know, getting insight into those habits is challenging. I tell a story in the book about um, uh, my wife and I were in New Zealand about a decade ago. Uh, we were driving from, uh, from like Christchurch up to Marlborough on the on the South Island through the mountains, really windy little road. And um, it was really my first time to have ever driven on the left side of the road. And we come up to this uh, construction area where they had the, it's like the lights when they put you on one side of the road, they, they put us on the right side of the road and, you know, drive for a couple miles and the construction ends at some point, but I don't realize that it ends. So I'm just kind of driving along on the right side of the road for some number of miles until basically I come around a corner and there's a car in my face. Fortunately, we were going slow. We didn't hit anything, but, um, but it's just, you know, it speaks to the fact that even though I was really intently trying to drive on the left side of the road, just a little bit of distraction sort of just turn, you know, put me back in the habit mode um, and, you know, could have been really bad. Yeah, well, good for you for trying. I went to South Africa and I just decided not to try. Right. <laughs> um, so, okay, so habits, you know, we talked a lot about bad habits, but they're also good habits, yep. right? So, but it seems like good habits are harder to create 
yep. then bad habits are to, you know, to burn, well, I mean, then bad habits. So, yep. so Tom, why would that be the case? Is that the case, first of all? Yep. And if so, why would that be the case? I think it's pretty, I mean, intuitively, it's certainly the case. Um, and, you know, there's some work, it's interesting, you know, people, there, there's this lore about, you know, habits taking 21 days to, uh, to create, which turns out to basically be, you know, something made up by a guy writing a pop psychology book. Isn't that like 10,000 hours or something? Uh, that's something different. That's, that's something expertise. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, that's a, that's more like expertise. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's like the far end of habits, right? Got it, got it. Um, okay. But it turns out that like, you know, some recent work looked at like, look at people trying to develop various have various quote unquote good habits. And, you know, it took anywhere from like, you know, what, two weeks to four months, I think. Um, so, you know, there's a big range in kind of how, but clearly they, it's, you know, it can take a long time to establish a good habit. And I think one of the reasons is that, you know, the things that we call bad habits are generally habits that are driven by sort of strong rewards, right? Um, Whereas um, the things that we think of as good habits are generally things that we don't really want to do, you know, be it flossing or going to the gym, you know, uh, whatever that might be. Um, and the problem is that we don't get when you don't get any kind of you know rewarding outcome, you don't have dopamine to help you establish that habit, you know, through that the kind of plasticity that I talked about earlier. And so you have to rely on other mechanisms. And in particular, you know, you have to rely on the prefrontal cortex kind of driving, you know, having this goal of, oh, hey, I need to floss tonight. I need to remember to floss. Um, and developing a habit through that type of, you know, what you might call top-down kind of control um, is just much harder. Um, and it and, and that's part of why it takes much longer is because you don't have the the kind of the support of the the dopamine system. Um, I just want to say to the audience, so um, in about ten minutes, I'll stop and take questions. So if you have questions, please put them into the Q and A. Um, I will read them. Uh, so give us your name so we can acknowledge you. And uh, I'm, I'm, I still have a bunch of questions for us before we get there. So um, all right. So so speaking about good habits, uh, this also gets to breaking bad habits. You talk about this new scientific emphasis on behavior change, um, you know, and this has been something you talk about the National Institute of Health, um, sort of emphasizing behavior change. Can you say a little bit more about what that is yep. and how it relates to this idea of habits? Yeah. So, you know, anybody who's ever tried to make any kind of change in their life, you know, especially sort of a healthy change, be it, you know, quitting smoking or starting to exercise, any of these things, you know, will we'll, we'll one, realize how difficult behavior, changing one's behavior. So when we talk about behavior change, we're speaking very broadly about, you know, the ability to, to behave differently in a way that is in service of some kind of usually health goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one thing we know is that, you know, a huge proportion of health out of, you know, of bad health outcomes could be prevented by behavior change. You know, smoking is by far the, the top one of those, right? If, if people could just snap their finger and stop smoking tomorrow, you know, so much, uh, you know, illness would be avoided in terms of like cancer, heart disease, chronic lung diseases. Um, and, but it's hard, right? So a lot of the research has shown that it actually hasn't changed at all really in the last like four decades that, you know, it, when people try to quit something, be it alcohol, smoking, drugs, uh, you know, about a third of them last a year in terms of like how long they can stay abstinent. Um, and, and like I said, that hasn't changed. You know, there's been a ton of research, but you know, we haven't really gotten better at helping people figure out how to change their behavior. And so that's why the NIH has gotten really interested in this because it, it spans all the different classes of diseases. Um, and, um, and, it, and we realized that it could, you know, the ability to easily change behavior would be much more powerful than any particular drug that anybody could develop for a disease. It makes a bit, it makes a lot of sense and it's kind of surprising that it's sort of a new thing right yeah. that the national institute of health is, is emphasizing um all right so now let's get to the so I, I will say in reading your book you know the first part of it um you know beautiful neuroscience going through the details of what we know about habits you know and linking in the the, the work in animals with you know not non-human animals with innovative techniques with what we know in humans Really, really great. But that book is a that part of your book is more than three quarters of the book, I think, right? Because yep. the second part of the book is sort of you know the 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 big question, right? 
Um, and and I just to give you credit up front in the first chapter, you say, you know, we still aren't quite there yet. But the second part of the book is what do we do now? Like, what if we have a habit that we want to break? How do we, you know, what is the best science today telling us? Um, and I and and you know, I know it's frustrating because that's that everyone wants to know that. Like, what is the is, there is there a magic bullet now? And then I'm going to ask you about you know in the future later. But go ahead. <laughs> Right, right. What are the the eight simple tricks to get rid of your habits, right? And exactly. unfortunately, there are no such eight simple tricks. And part of the, you know, one of the points I try to make, right, is that, you know, changing behavior is hard. And um, that should, that should lead us to be empathetic for people who have trouble changing their behavior, right? Yeah. Um, it's not as if they have poor willpower or something like that. It's really, it's, you know, it's fundamentally a, a really hard thing. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of presented, you know, on the web and the press, uh, you know, in terms of like methods that people suggest to work that, you know, often aren't really well supported by evidence. And I talk about some of those in the book. There's also some stuff that I think is, you know, fairly well supported. Um, and a lot of that has to do with sort of things that you do before you ever kind of get into the situation of having to like, you know, suppress a habit. Um, you know, because we know that like our, our ability to control our behavior, once we end up kind of in the heat of the moment is just fundamentally poor, right? Our, our prefrontal cortex is just weak when it, in, when it comes up against our, the power of our habit system. Um, and so, you know, the things that seem, the things that are well-established are particularly things like, you know, planning ahead. Like there's this idea of what are called implementation intentions, like, you know, if I end up in a situation, well, say I'm trying to, you know, to not smoke and I have to go to a place where, you know, I'm often tempted to smoke, kind of walking through in my head, what exactly will I do when that, you know, in order to avoid the, 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 the habit getting triggered, or if it starts to get triggered, how will I, you know, kind of deal with that situation? It's really like planning ahead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other ideas that seem to have, you know, some evidence behind them. Um, another, another interesting one is, you know, temptation bundling, where you basically, you only allow yourself to do something that you like to do, but you know, you shouldn't do if you do it at the same time as you're, you know, as you're doing something good. So you only let yourself watch the, the trashy TV show when you're on the treadmill, right? Um, there's, there's a number of things like that. that before that, with the Knicks, so, you know. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so I, you know, I talk about a number of those things in the book, but none of them is a magic bullet. So, okay, so, so what things don't work? What do people think, what, you know, what are the kinds of things you hear about, you know, obviously breaking bad habits is something that lots of people talk about and there's lots of advice out there. What, what doesn't work that people think might work? Um, yeah, interesting. So I think that, uh, well, there, there's, you know, one of the things that people have talked about a lot in the last few years is this, this idea of sort of nudges, right? Of um, kind of just giving people a little sort of, pushes to push them in the right direction, or maybe even like giving them a little reward to help them go in the right direction. Um, and there's now a lot of work that shows that, you know, if you, um, for example, you know, there's this idea um, from, from addiction where you can actually like pay addicts not to take the drugs, right? And that works really well as long as you keep paying them. Once you stop paying them, they, you know, the effects go away pretty quickly. And similar things have been seen with exercise. Katie Milkman and Angela Duckworth did a really large study that you know looked at the ability to kind of nudge people to exercise, and it kind of worked as long as you were nudging them, but the but the effects uh, didn't really last. Um, another you know another thing I talk about in the book that's sort of interesting, but I think where the the evidence is still uh, not there is meditation. Mm -hmm. That you know meditation, I think it's a really interesting thing, and it may well have like you know really good effects. But the the science behind meditation is um, in terms of like you know especially for things like changing habits is, um, is pretty shaky right now. But, but, but it does have an effect on stress, which is something that you also link to habits. So can you say That's a little bit That's true. About that? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, um, so the, the interesting thing about stress is that it, you know, impacts the ability of our prefrontal cortex to function. Um, Amy Arnston from Yale has done really nice work showing how exactly different neurochemicals like dopamine and nor noradrenaline, which is the stress 
chem stress neurochemical, how they basically degrade the ability of neurons in the prefrontal cortex to kind of do their thing. And that means that, you know, the ability to control one's behavior, that's what the prefrontal cortex does for us, that becomes even weaker. And so it's even harder to kind of both, you know, work in service of your goals and to sort of resist any kind of, you know, temptation that you need to resist. Yeah, for me, like, you know, if I'm trying to take off 10 pounds, like when I'm stressed, you know, I'm not worried about that so much. Right. Um, okay, so I want to, um, so you, so you, you go through the science of, you know, what, what has been shown to really work, uh, what doesn't really work. So it's, uh, two other questions about, so are there p particular types of people that are better at, like, are, are some people just better at, you know, sort of dealing with their bad habits than others? Like, it's, you know, are there, are there personal, are there, you know, variabilities in their personality that make some people good at this? Like, do they have better willpower, for instance? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The willpower is an interesting one, right? I mean, certainly there are people, you know, some people have better what we might call self-control than others, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as psychologists, we can give people questionnaires and ask them questions like, do you say things that you later regret saying, or do you make impulse buys at the grocery store? And we see that some people systematically kind of behave in more what we call impulsive or less controlled ways, right? And so there's this idea that that might have something to do with our ability to, to break habits and that it, that focuses around this idea of willpower, right? That if we could just resist our habits, mm -hmm. um, that that would, that's, that's the key, right? And it turns out that some recent research suggests that that might be the wrong way to, that might not actually be what willpower is all about. Um, so Wilhelm Hoffman and his colleagues did this interesting study a while ago, they gave people devices. Um, they were Blackberries actually, because this was like 10 years ago. And they would buzz at them you know, a few times a day. And they would basically say, have you experienced a desire in the last 30 minutes? And then if they said yes, uh, did you try to resist the desire? And if they said yes, then uh, were you successful in resisting the desire? And then they, they, these people also filled out a bunch of those questionnaires where you you know, see who claims to have high self-control and who doesn't. So you would, if, you know, if willpower was really about like resisting urges, then you would think that the people with good self-control would be going through the world, resisting their urges more effectively, but that's not actually what they found. It turns out that the people with high willpower and low power, low willpower basically claim to resist their urges equally often. The big difference was that the people who have good self-control had fewer urges in the first place. Um, and it's, it's relevant to, the, to some work that, um, that Angela Duckworth has done showing that basically people with good self-control seem to be particularly good at developing good habits, right? And probably like, you know, stay, you know, either like never developing the bad habits or kind of, you know, being able to avoid the temptation in the first place. Got it. Okay. So, so in the last chapter of your book, you talk about um, this, what you call hacking. Right. These, and these are sort of new neuroscientific insights that might be relevant to, um, you know, behavior change and, and changing habits in the future. Yeah. So of all of the ones that you mentioned, which one do you think is most promising at this particular point in time? Like which one if you had to imagine, you know, which one might actually break through and work? Oh, um, interesting. Um, yeah. So let me just say what the menu is, right? Yeah, I mean, the menu is really, um, the menu is really drugs that can erase memories, right? Um, or particular kind of behavioral techniques that can help, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you've worked on that can help try to erase memories, um, or stimulation of the brain using this stuff we call optogenetics, right? Which basically uses light to, to control the activity of neurons. Um, that um, that is certainly more so you know optogenetics is almost certainly the most precise of any of those mechanisms i think um the challenge there is going to be actually getting optogenetics into humans because it would it would require brain surgery and it would require gene therapy to put you know the the ion channels into your neurons using viruses a scary. And, yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot <laughs> scary yeah um so i think actually that in terms of like something that's closest to being like really applicable in the world, I think actually the kind of, you know, techniques that you've worked with, like, you know, looking at what we call reconsolidation, which where you basically like, you know, um, ex like kind of cause a, a memory to be reactivated and then use what we know about 
memories to basically somehow disrupt that memory because because we've learned through you know work from, from from a lot of people in the last couple of decades that memories become unstable whenever you retrieve them and you can actually kind of cause them to be degraded um you know i think that that technique still isn't ready for prime time either but i think it, it's I it's certainly the it's the least um, it's the it's the least science fictiony of all of them yeah and it's also the least you know invasive but at the right. same time but uh, but you know having worked in this area i agree with you i think we you know there's several different types of memory you know, how do you target the right one how do we know a memory is active in the human brain without any you know sort of technique to really look in the human brain that tells us exactly the time point and what's the right intervention or, or questions but i but you know i would be excited personally because i'm right. invested in that uh that research um, okay, so I have just two more questions for you. Um, so first one, what is your worst habit? <laughs> what is my worst habit? And, you know, um, why haven't you changed it yet? Can I, I can go get my <laughs> wife and ask her. Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, probably, um, you know, a Kate, I'm, I've actually been pretty good at stopping uh, getting rid of sweets. You know, I definitely have not gotten rid of wine and COVID <laughs> has not helped with that. Um, so, you know, my, my bad habit is probably drinking more wine than I should. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it, it's, I know all the things one should do. And I'm, you know, I know I'm sometimes successful when I decide, hey, I shouldn't, you know, shouldn't drink as much this week. I'm successful at doing that. Um, but, um, but it's, it's, you know, my, all my knowledge about how the habit system works has not endowed me with any sort of special powers when it comes to breaking <laughs> habits. Um, well, you know, you didn't tell us a really bad one. So maybe we'll follow up afterwards. Um, but uh, so, okay, last question I have, and then we'll go to the, to the, um, to the, uh, the attendees. So imagine it's 2045, right? So 25 years or 2046, sorry, 25 years from now. Do you think the science of behavior change, you know, where we try to break these bad habits because they're bad for our health, right? Because they're related to things like cancer and heart disease and other things that, you know, can kill us. Do you think we would have made like a lot of significant progress in that time? Are you optimistic is just what I'm asking you about you know, the, the science evolving in such a way that it does become practical for people in their everyday lives? I, th I, I think I am, um, in part because I think there's an ongoing change in how people are starting to think about studying these things. I think that, as I talk about in the book, the approach that's been used to try to study behavior change for the last, you know, four or five decades hasn't really tried to get at, me at the mechanisms of behavior change. And now people are thinking a lot more about that, kind of driven by work of some people at the National Institutes of Health um, in the Science of Behavior Change program. So I think that that's going to, you know, in the same way that like moving towards trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of cancer brought about, you know, in the last uh, few years, these new treatments that can much more, you know, at least occasionally much more effectively and in a much more targeted way treat specific cancers based on the, the exact biology of the cancer. I think the idea is we, you know, we could have the same kind of progress in understanding behavior change. I hope so. I, I, I agree with you. I think we're getting there. And I think, you know, the fact that, you know, it's, it's odd that it took so long to really recognize the importance of this um, as, as a major health, uh, you know, intervention. Um, but, you know, the, the obviously uh, it is a major health intervention and I'm glad we're starting to focus on it. All right. So I'm going to go to some of the questions now um, from the attendees. So the first is from Ami Solenki. Um, is there a difference in the stickiness of a good versus a bad habit? Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know of research on this. I mean, intuitively, certainly there is. And I think that the one the so, you know, what we know about, you know, the, the stickiness of habits comes in part because like anytime the first like the first thing that one learns in a particular situation often becomes like the default behavior. Um, and um, the, you know, in general, bad habits aren't going to be the, I'm uh, sorry, good habits aren't going to be the first thing that you learned in the situation. They become kind of an add on. So they, they generally become both much more difficult to create and much less likely to sort of, you know, come back and to stick around. Um, all right. So, Mark Pizzato, do emotions or moods, positive or negative, become habits that might be changed and how? And in which brain ne networks does that involve? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think, you know, I, I think emotions, moods, thoughts, 
all these things can become habits just like behaviors can. Um, and so I, you know, I guess I, I think they, they probably rely on different brain systems. You know, I mean, you, you've, you've done a lot of work around, you know, one particular emotion, fear, right? Um, and the brain systems that are kind of involved in that becoming conditioned and ultimately becoming a habit. So I think that there certainly are, and I don't, I don't actually know what the systems would be for sort of, you know, like moods, um, you know, but, um, you know, emotion is kind of a, a far flung thing in the brain, right? Um, but, uh, but certainly it is the case that, you know, and thoughts as well, like, and I think, you know, when we think about like obsessive compulsive disorder is like the extreme version of thoughts becoming habits. So they're just automatically continually, you know, sort of uh, uh, retrieved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I often I often wonder, you know, to what extent that you know, there, there's one finding out there that, which is a great for those of us who are getting older, right? That the older you get, the more positive outlook you have. But you know, and that's partially due to just how do you interpret, you know, the things are they glass is the glass half full or half empty? And I, I wonder if that just be, can become a habit for people if you do it a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is one. This is an anonymous attendee, but this question is very near and dear to my heart. Um, because I'm actually going through the same thing. What is a winning strategy to create a positive habit for successfully getting one's children to practice piano or anything they don't see as fun for the long term? They seem to love it once they can perform a piece, but the fight to, but but fight the learning process and complain about having to practice. It's a constant struggle. The short like answer is is I have no idea. <laughs> I started um, to reward bucks things at my house. You get a dollar every time you practice, but you know. Right, right. No, I think that actually, you know, well, I think you know the right the, the the question is how do you make them motivated to do it on their own? How do you make it fun enough? And rewards obviously could play a role in that. And there, there's a an, another interesting question buried in there about like you know wh where does the reward from like self like success at something like you know playing a piano piece come from? Mm -hmm. Something that I've thought about a lot, but I don't I don't think there's really any science on kind of the reward of success. It's an interesting question. Um, it is a good question, yeah. Um, and I think if you can come up with a great answer, I'll, you know, I'd like to know. Um, all right, so this is from William Brewer. It says, hi, Russ, Bill Brewer here. Hey, um, um, Absent-mindedness plan slips seem to fit nicely into your approach. Example, a professor goes into his bedroom to change into formal clothes for a concert. His wife comes in and finds him in his pajamas. Do you have an account? Yeah, um, I think so. I talk a bit about these sort of action slips in the book, um, and I think that it's a it's a great example of the the power of these kind of extended routines, right? That if you have a the the, the thing that becomes really difficult um, in like you know in breaking habits is like once you've started the routine, you you know you your your mind it becomes mindless as I was talking about before, and we've all had this experience right of like needing to stop somewhere on the way home, getting home and realizing that we forgot to stop at that place right because the 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 route of getting home has just become such a such an automatic sort of habitual thing, um, and there's there's lots of interesting neuroscience on this you know Anne Graybill and her colleagues at MIT have done great stuff showing like you know, in rats exactly how the activity in the basal ganglia goes from being like continuous through the whole behavior to like starting at the beginning and then basically going away until they're done doing their whole routine. Um, and so I think that there's a, there's a good explanation for that in terms of like the, the kind of chunking together of a whole bunch of behaviors into one big routine that becomes automatic as a whole. So um, next question is from Felix Bergel. I, I actually want to say Felix, I think the whole book is about this, this question, but I'll let Russ take a, a short stab at it. So it says, hello, thank you very much for such interesting conversation. My question, are there biological or physiological obstacles to breaking habits? Hmm. I mean, I think that there, yeah, there's a, so there's a, there's a number of ways to, to kind of think about that. Um, one is simply the, you know, as I mentioned, the, the relative fragility of the prefrontal cortex, right? When we, whatever we need to exert control, we have to rely on the prefrontal cortex, and we know that it's easily disrupted by by stress, um, by lack of sleep, by you know lots of different things. Um, and so, um, that's certainly probably the biggest one. Um, and then the I think the other you know the other physiological obstacle, if you think about it as an obstacle, it's really the degree to which you know we live now in a in an environment that stimulates us in ways that our dopamine system and the rest of our brain weren't evolved to deal with right so we're so we're you know 
if you go take a lot of different drugs like cocaine or methamphetamine, they kind of directly turn on your dopamine system, right? Or like cause dopamine to hang around, right? That's so far outside of our evolutionary experience that we're just not equipped to deal with those sorts of things. So Nancy Lyons asks a very relevant question. How do you explain a failure to wear masks or get a vaccine in terms of habits when the downside is so clear? Yeah, this is really interesting. And I think actually it points to something that that I don't really address at all in the book, except at the very end when I talk about, you know, climate change and COVID. Um, and um, but that has to do with like an, another layer of like behavior change, right? Which is which has to do with kind of mindsets and beliefs and ideologies, right? So in some ways, you know, like if you don't believe you need to change your behavior, then there's no need to, right? Back when people thought smoking was healthy, there was no need to stop smoking. Um, and so, um, so I think it's, this is highlighted, I think both in the context of, you know, I think the, the whole like, you know, anti-mask uh, thing is, is one version of this, the kind of, you know, opposition to, um, to change is relevant to, to, you know, societal change is relevant to climate change is another, that, um, that ultimately, you know, for, for any kind of change to happen, there has to be a, a mindset or a belief that drives that change. And, and they can be really powerful, right? It's like I, you know, about a decade ago, I, I made a big change in my diet. I had been like vegetarian, high carb for a long time, wasn't feeling particularly healthy and decided to basically change my diet to really cut out sweets, become like a meat eating, low carb nut. And, <laughs> and it worked, but it really, you know, to make it work, cause I had like sugar cravings like crazy, right? But to make it work, the thing that made it work was having this mindset of like, oh, this is, this is the way I have to eat if I wanna be healthy, right? And that translates then into like, you know, the motivation to do the things that you think you need to do, but ultimately it has to come from that high level belief or mindset. And so that's this, I think this whole societal moment is kind of highlighting the importance of that. So, um, so this gets back to, hold on, I'm gonna go back to another question, which was, uh, so this was a, a, from Amit uh, Solanke again, this relates to this. So what, what role does human intent play in the creation, sustenance, and getting rid of habits? Human intent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. Well, I guess the first you know, question is like, what, what role does intent play in our behavior? Like everybody thinks that you know, when they go do things in the world, they're doing them because they, they want to do them, right? Or they intend to do them. Um, you know, Wendy Wood and her colleagues did some work a while ago, basically trying to quantify like, you know, when, when people do things, are they really doing them because they want to do them or are they doing them because they've done them before? And it turned out that a lot of behavior can be accounted for simply by the fact that it's a habit, that it's something that's the thing you've done previously in the same situation. So the first thing is just to realize that, you know, that the idea that everything we do, it, it comes from an intention is, is clearly you know, not the right way to think about human behavior. Much of what we do has to do with habit. Um, and I think the, you know, on the flip side, the, the stuff that I talked about in terms of like implementation intentions, right? Mm -hmm. um, where you think about what will I do in this particular situation? That turns out to be a, a well-established you know, method, or at least there's, there's evidence for it from, from controlled trials suggesting that it can actually help people change their behavior. Um, so that's a place where, you know, used in the right way, in, and I hope this is like, I hope I'm getting at the, the questioner's uh, intent here, if you will. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's a place where like, you know, intention can be used in the right way to actually help behavior change work. So um, Nikhil Vass asks, what is the effect of a companion, for example, a spouse in breaking or making habits? It's like an external prefrontal cortex. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it, well, one, it, so, you know, one of the really hard parts about breaking habits is like realizing that you're doing the thing, right. Um, kind of getting insight into, you know, it's like, like I used to bite my fingernails, um, and, um, I, di I didn't really realize I was biting I, my fingernails. I just did it. Right. Um, and so having a spouse who is, you know, saying, Hey, will you stop doing that? Right. <laughs> Um, it is, it, it helps you gain insight into 
the um, the frequency with which you do it, the situations in which you do it, and it helps you give it helps give you motivation, right? I never had motivation to not bite my fingernails, but then when it when I realized that it annoyed my wife so much, that gave me motivation to actually make that change. So I think between the the kind of insight and the motivation, those are both aspects where like other people in your life can actually help, including spouses, can help drive that. I, lo I love the spouses, your, your external prefrontal cortex. To remember that. Um, all right. So this is kind of a tough question, um, but it's from DH. It says, Rush, a generalization of what you're saying diminishes some of what's popularly believed about free will, free choice and free will. Do you believe in free will? Do I have to answer that question? <laughs> no, you do not have to answer that question. Um, no, I, you know, I, I, I think I think I have free will. Um, I don't, you know, the, these are the kinds of questions that I try not to spend much time thinking about just because I don't know that they're answerable. Um, I think they're interesting. Um, and I like to occasionally read, you know, philosophers talk about them. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think when I make choices that I, I can do things on my free will, but I don't know how to scientifically, uh, establish that. Well, clearly the notion that, you know, you're doing, you know, sometimes you do, you continue in habits, even when, yep. you know, it's not your intention, right? Yep. Yep. Speaks to th that, it doesn't mean that there isn't free will. It just means that, you know, we're not always, you know, doing, you know, acting according to our conscious attentions, right? Exactly. I uh, certainly believe, you know, there's this idea, I think it comes from B.S. Ramachandran of free won't, right? And I certainly believe that I have the ability to not do something that I was going to do um, by, by force of will, whatever that is. So I don't know if you if you know anything about this, but, but Greg Burke asks, is there a role for hypnosis in altering habits? Uh, interesting question. I don't know anything about uh, evidence for or against that. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll take two more. So, um, so David Vasek says, hi, Russ. Thank you for a great talk. Um, given habits developed to establish long-term goals or to, or to claim implicit or indirect rewards, um, would you recommend a way to bring rewards closer to the present or to make or more explicit when when starting to develop a new good habit? So, I mean, I think I think this builds on like this, right, this idea that you talked about for the good habits, there's not really a reward, yeah, right? Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, one of the um, it's, uh, thanks, David, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that we it's exactly right, right, that why do I floss at night? Um, it's because I'm, I'm doing that in service of like a reward that isn't going to come for years down the road, right? Like my, you know, not getting gum disease, um, or months, what some point down the road, right? And that's a, one of the things we know about future rewards is that they're much more, um, we, our, our mind treats them as much more abstract than immediate rewards, right? Like an, an immediate reward is like something I, it's tangible, right? Uh, a, the reward, the long-term reward of not getting gum disease is like really abstract, right? And so one of the things people have thought about is like, you know, there's this whole idea of like having, like thinking about episodes in the future, right? Episodic future thinking to like bring, make things in the future more immediate. Um, the, I, the evidence on that, I think, isn't, you know, really great yet. Uh, certainly in the context of behavior change, I haven't seen any sort of, you know, established evidence, but that's, that's one idea about how to potentially make those kind of longer term rewards of quote unquote good habits more salient in the short term. So, okay, last question I'll take, um, and I'm gonna just sort of add something to the end of this question because I think it's related, uh, is by Gwen Spieth. Um, it says, how do you move from having an external prefrontal cortex to being motivated on your own? And she's talking here about young adults sort of becoming independent of their parents and their own sort of healthy self-care. So I was, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was hoping you'd also say a little bit about, you know, adolescence and development and yeah. Yeah. Uh, habits. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting ideas about what, what's happening during development, right? And we know the, the one thing we certainly know is that the prefrontal cortex develops relatively late compared to the rest of the brain. And there's at least some evidence to suggest that the reward systems develop relatively early, right, compared to the prefrontal cortex. And that there's been claims that that sort of mismatch between like, you know, the reward systems turning up early and the prefrontal cortex not turning on until you're 20 might re relate to some of the very impulsive behavior that we see in, uh, in adolescence. Um, you know, how the question of, you know, how to optimize that is a good one. And I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that. Um, 
other than providing, you know, one of the things that we know is really powerful in adolescence is uh, social influence, right? That, you know, adolescents are particularly willing to like take risks and do impulsive things in a context of, you know, of kind of peer pressure. Um, and so, you know, figuring out how to kind of, you know, organize things socially so that kids end up in situations. Now, the problem is, right, we can't choose our, kid, our kids' friends, right? Um, but, but I think, you know, it's kind of understanding that and, and maybe trying to highlight the degree to which, it, you know, peer pressure is a really powerful influence might be one way to think about that. Great. So um, before we close, do you have anything else you want to uh, say about habits or your book? I mean, I, I, I thought it was terrific. I really enjoyed it. And like I said, I think for for people that really want to understand the neuroscience, I think it's one of the, you know, in terms of, you know, what's happening in the brain with habits, what's happening in the brain when you try to stop habitual behaviors uh, and where we could potentially go in the future. You know, I think it was it was incredible just reading like the, the level, the, the ease with which you were able to convey the, uh, the complicated science behind habits. Anything you want to say before we close today? No, well, thanks, Liz. I mean, I, I really appreciate that. And that's because that's exactly what I tried to do. And I think that, you know, I think our discussion has done a good job of highlighting like all the different things There's that I talk about in the book. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, cool. I, I can't wait to see what happens in, uh, in uh, 20, what, 2046. Right. <laughs> yeah. We'll still be around. <laughs> Well, thank you tremendously, both of you, for this fascinating discussion. And I also want to thank everyone who joined us this evening. We had so many thoughtful questions in the chat tonight. Um, if anyone would like to learn more, copies of Hard to Break are for sale on harvard.com via the links that I have been putting in the chat. Um, so on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, have a good evening, everyone. Keep reading, and please, please be well. Thank you.